here at the Sajiko Cave Hill School of Business and Management, located at the University of the West Indies Cave Hill campus, we meet the needs of the upwardly mobile professionals. Our business school functions in an evolving global space where the need to have that competitive edge distinguishes you as a professional. Our academic curriculum offers a variety of programs that gives you that edge. We offer our students a doctorate in business administration. Then, there's our executive masters in business administration. Our Sajiko Cave School of Business and Management is for you. Enroll now. Welcome to our webinar. Welcome to Friday webinars at the Business School, UWI Cave Hill. My name is Marjorie Wharton, and I am the Strategic Business Services Director and Clinical Faculty with the Sajikor Cave Hill School of Business at UWI Cave Hill Campus. And I'm your host for this event today. Our topic today is digital economies, payment systems, this webinar brings together a panel of global digital payment architects who will explore the future of payments in the Caribbean and the rest of the world. With their backgrounds in banking and digital technologies, they are perfectly placed to share their expertise and insight on the challenges of payment infrastructures in the Caribbean and what can be done to address the issues that hinder our economies from fully engaging in digital and e-commerce business activities. They will address the future of banking, regional transactions, faster payment systems, central bank digital currencies, online payment functionality, and digital payments for merchants. As always, our webinar is scheduled to run for an hour and 15 minutes. As the discussion progresses, please feel free to ask your questions as we go along. On your screens, you will find the control panel, which gives the option labeled Q&A, and you may use that option at any point during the webinar to submit your questions. For those of you on Facebook, you can simply type them in. We are following and we will share them with the panel as well. Here in Zoom, you can use the chat feature, and as we go along, our panel will try to respond to as many of the questions that we receive as time allows. For this webinar, your moderator will be Mr. Roland Haggins. Roland is the Executive in Residence at the UWI Sajikor Cato School of Business and Management. He has over 15 years of global finance and technology industry expertise and has been invited to speak by various governments, including the governments of India, Uganda, regional central banks, and global organizations, including the International Monetary Fund, the Commonwealth Telecommunications Union, the United Nations International Telecommunications Union, and the International Labor Organization. A leading digital economy specialist, Roland also has expertise in finance and technology, strategic planning, business development operations, and the global regulatory environment. He's also used his knowledge of the financial system to develop, coordinate, and lecture banking and finance courses for the University of the West Indies Open Campus, including ethics in banking and finance. Roland holds a bachelor's degree with first class honors in economics and banking from the University of Greenwich and a master's of science degree with distinction in economics, finance and investment from Queen Mary University of London. So welcome to you, Roland, and over to you and your panel. Thank you so much, Marjorie, for bringing such a wonderful energy and, and that marvelous introduction. Uh, we've got a very exciting panel today. Uh, we're looking at the global architects of the, the uh, payment systems 
and we have some experts here. We've got uh, Dr. Patrick Tannis. He's a banking and blockchain regulatory expert uh, at Tannis Consultancy Inc. And Patrick has had a long uh, career in banking uh, from the days when Barclays was in the Caribbean. Uh, Patrick headed up the, uh, the wealth division there and he's advised some very, very large clients. He's a very high profile uh, banker with a lot of um, uh, clients that you would know their names and I won't mention any of them, but he's, he had a, a speciality in wealth generation, wealth retention, wealth management, offshore and international banking, currency management, compliance, and, and digital and blockchain-based finance instruments. So all of the, the visa cards and the PIMP systems that we see throughout the Caribbean, uh, uh, Patrick had a, a role in, in the early implementation of those. So he's seen everything over the years in terms of payments. And now we're at this, this stage where we're on, on the, the cusp of, of a digital financial revolution in the Caribbean and Dr. Tannis is, is leading this. Uh, in addition, we have George Thomas, who is one of the leads from the digital side at CIBC First uh, Caribbean. And we will make clear that the thoughts today that George gives us are his own. They don't represent uh, CIBC First Caribbean in any way. Uh, but George, is, I, I've, I've known George for a while. I've seen him around from the time that he's, he was working uh, in the Middle East, in Dubai, with some uh, digital technologies there, mobile technologies, uh, with firms such as uh, uh, Mazido, which is cable and wireless, uh, uh, Price Waterhouse, the learning company, Monster.com, uh, Goldman Sachs, Putnam Investments. Um, George has a long history in banking and in management consulting and executive leadership. Uh, we're very pleased to have George on this call. He's an expert in this emerging field of cryptocurrencies, blockchain technology, and he's a specialist on nearshore solutions architecture, as well as global architecture. So he, he's providing a wealth of experience and, and I thank you for being here. George specializes in understanding uh, the, the regulatory environment and the backend digital environment surrounding uh, cryptocurrencies right from their creation uh, end to end. We also have, uh, who I'm not sure is on the call at the moment, but should be joining, Bradley Wilkes. Uh, he's the, the founder and the president uh, slash CEO of the Open Payment Network. And this was founded in 2009, uh, and we can call it the OPN for short, the Open Payment Network. This is a platform that allows for individuals and businesses to pay one another with cash from mobile devices. It's a back end payment system uh, and, and you could pretty much say an ACH for banks. So it covers the, the entire digital financial ecosystem. It's a compliance system and uh, Brad's history starts from uh, formulating the payment processing for Visa, MasterCard and, uh, and millions of merchants that were on the system. Welcome, Brad. We're, we're just talking about you now. We're just giving your introduction. Oh, thank you. Brad has been awarded six payments uh, from the, the U.S. Payment and Trademark Office. He received an MBA with an emphasis in technology management from the University of Phoenix and a BSc from Brigham Univer uh, Young University in Provo, Utah. He's a member of the Association of Certified Anti-Money Laundering Specialists. So we have on this call some of the, the, the regional and global architects of the digital financial architecture that we're gonna see that will be used in the future. So welcome to our panelists, welcome to all our attendees. Thank you for joining us. This should be an exciting call. So what we wanna do in this, in this call is we wanna start off perhaps by um, asking Brad. Brad, we, we have some uh, regional problems here that, that we'll get into. Um, but one of the challenges is, uh, from a regional perspective, our banks communicating with each other, uh, doing currency transactions, uh, uh, remittances that come in uh, from abroad. Uh, how do you see us moving forward in terms of the future of banking for this region?
that can benefit and, and strengthen our, our economies. Because we understand that, that finance is at the heart of our economies and we want to have more robust economies and we need to have that banking infrastructure in place. So what do you see as the future of banking that can help this region and the globe in general? Yeah, well, I think, I think the first thing to recognize is that modernization of, of payments is an activity for everybody globally. So that effort is happening across the globe. It's happening in the US, Singapore, Australia, the UK, um, a number of initiatives that are occurring. And so, so it's an effort that we're undertaking to improve our uh, global financial system. Um, payments is a part of that. Payments uh, to, to be improved would be faster, uh, whether that's an immediate payment or, or delayed or deferred settlement uh, at a later date. Uh, both of those initiatives are uh, important. The primary thing along with uh, the speed of the payment though is being able to do it safely and securely um, with a high degree of efficiency. So the question is, how fast can we move money safely and securely and efficiently? Can we actually lower the cost of, of transactions and do them uh, more rapidly with modern um, technologies? Absolutely. And we have this regional challenge where our central banks need to communicate to each other uh, and, and where we need currency transactions to take place seamlessly. Um, Patrick, what are your thoughts on on the solutions for this you you're you're one of these uh the probably one of the most influential people in the caribbean and especially in terms of banking and also from a central bank perspective understanding how these things work and how these payment systems and and clearing houses can all integrate what would you say is a is a, is a solution for the future for this region and for the globe in general well, good morning, and uh, it's good to be here. It's good to hear Brad and to see you guys. And uh, George, good to see you. And uh, Roland, you're awesome as ever, man. Yeah. And uh, welcome to the audiences, and uh, wonderful introduction again by our good friend Marjorie. Uh, one of the things that the Caribbean has is it has tremendously good leaders, stable government. And out of that, we've, we've had a uh, cousin-like and... Uh, an, an unusual friendship, especially in the area of Barbados with the United States. Now, the U.S. is the largest and the leading economy across the globe. And so the U.S. currency is the pivot that we are anchored to. What I believe is the next step is for the digital currency revolution to occur, uh, not just now uh, the bond with, with a fixed rate with the United States currency, but to do more. And what Brad and the OPN are doing with the Federal Reserve is to have a digital currency that has a similar uh, trading platform and a clearing platform. And Brad's company, the OPN, is uh, about to sign off, and perhaps they have done it already, to have a Federal Reserve current account, which allows for, uh, this is where it gets, it gets exciting. So we're really in the next phase of it because you know, we fixed that problem of you going to the States and having a Caribbean card. You can choose with your card which currency you want to pay with. We want to take it a step further. Within the ether of that current account, we want to do a swap, which is simultaneously allowing for those currencies, especially currencies like Bar the Barbados dollar, which has a fixed rate, to be able to have a value within that system so that you can have a miscibility, a mixture that is fluent with that Barbados dollar and the U.S. dollar. And that's where the excitement begins. That's very exciting. And, you know, the cousin relationship where the U.S. and Barbados are joined at the hip, I believe that Barbados should be and will be the first country to do it. And then out of that, the rest of the region, which also have fixed rates, the monetary policy issues and so on, will become a very nice measure going forward, especially now that COVID is here, right? So that the, the, the leadership on this, only because of, of certain uh, specifics, Barbados can take the lead, but then we can bring in the OECD central bank and all the other central banks. The technology is here, I must say. And we actually have something inside the prime minister's office as we speak, 
if she signs off on it, this becomes a reality for Barbados. And then, of course, for the rest of the Caribbean. These are exciting times, Roland. Absolutely. So, Patrick, this, this, um, this sign-off that you're talking about here, how would this benefit the region? Like, like what, what kind of accessibility would it give us? Well, well here's, here's where it gets even more exciting now that you've asked that. Because the currency issues allow for uh, a, a changing of the economic pursuits and the spend, right? The expenditure. Because Barbados spends tons of money trying to earn U.S. dollars. So if Barbados doesn't have to earn those dollars spending millions, hundreds of millions of dollars in, in tourism and trying to attract international business and all that, trying to earn those U.S. dollars, now, by the click of a button, what Brad has created for Barbados is that, and the rest of the Caribbean, is that by the click of a button and transactions, you can have U.S. dollars because of that friendship, that friendship, that friendship with the United States. That becomes, right, a friendship that works for benefit now, right? And uh, that allows for uh, a changing of the expenditure. So there's a possibility of more savings for the governments. There are more jobs because people can be deployed to do different things. There's a complete change of the way that finances are accessible, are, are accessible by the small businesses, the larger businesses, and then by trade. You look at the trade component, right? We can now have U.S. banks coming to the Caribbean more readily. You can also have, okay, U.S. businesses coming more readily, U.S. investors coming more readily. There is a change coming, I can tell you. Roland, and, it's, and we're not talking about a change of tens of millions. We're talking about billions of investment coming to the Caribbean. That, that sounds amazing. And it sounds something that we need right now because we're going through some challenges with, with the lockdowns that we've seen. We're, we're not getting our usual foreign exchange earning through tourism. We haven't managed to diversify away from that to achieve uh, a foreign currency inflow through other industry, which which we've been uh, suggesting things like technology and international um, uh, compliance or, or or finance banking, etc. Uh, we've kind of we've kind of stalled on those a little bit in the Caribbean, and we now need to to find our feet again. So this sounds like a very uh, uh, interesting and feasible immediate solution to our problems. Now, one of the things that I know uh, people are gonna have difficulty grasping, particularly those that are not uh, up to date with the technologies that are existing right now, is uh, we have this, this uh, physical currency, and in the past, if people traveled and they wanted to, for, ex uh, for example, exchange Barbados dollars, uh, physical dollars for, um, uh, f you know, for a different currency, there would be this huge settlement uh, uh, challenge and issues and currency would have to actually physically get on planes or ships and move around. Like, how does this technology uh, solve some of these issues? Uh, would somebody like to, I mean, I'll open the floor for this. If Brad or Patrick or George wants to answer this, please feel free. Well, I guess, hi, yeah. good, good, good morning. <laughs> Patrick, you want to go on this one? Because I, I, I want to take a slightly different angle. But, so Patrick, go ahead if you will. Yeah, let, let, me, let me address this one again. And uh, Brad, you could come in, of course, and share at any time. Um, but Roland, here's, here's the beauty of it, right? <clears throat> Digitally solving the problem allows for the, um, the immediate solution to be fixed um, remotely. People don't have to send things around that are physical documents or as we say in the banking world, instruments don't have to move around. The instrument of cash, the instrument of a check or a soul of exchange or a money order. And those are instruments that, that usually have to have a physical presence, right? What we call them, they are bearer instruments, right? Um, to a larger extent, the, the physical cash, which is a fiat currency, is a bearer instrument. Who holds it can negotiate it, right? Now, in this case, this is interesting. There's also a bearer component, right? But the bearer is now a digital holder, right? And that's, that's exciting because you can transact uh, uh, where transfers now, which are more difficult. You can actually do those from the desktop of your computer. Your bank can be a facilitator, but not necessarily um, 
a, a, a hard end facilitator because there's a new ACH in mind through this system. There's a new capability to transfer regionally from island to island. And here is where it, uh, it kind of answers your question, right? The ease of access of, of foreign currency and then the yeah. ease of transfer are combined. Let me just chime in uh, just a little bit here and say the way to think about this in terms of what he's saying is, is if we can take the ease of physical currency transactions, um, the way that we've appreciated those over a long period of time since we started using physical currency, and we can mimic that in a digital version, that would be the ideal way uh, to secure and um, gain efficiency and speed and improvement in, in our systems through this uh, mimic of what fiat currency actually does for us. And that's what he's talking about. So a safe, secure way to, to exchange Barbadian dollars for US dollars back and forth that's really immediate. So that when I hand, hand Patrick a $100 bill, he's, he's got the full and complete payment. And when he hands me a $100 Barbados, I've got that. That's the, that's the concept of what, what this interbank settlement is trying to achieve. And it's important that the stakeholders uh, like the finance, regulated financial institutions um, are also participants. So, you know, that's why George is here and it's, and it's important to say, well, when we're making these changes, what are the roles of the stakeholders and the participants and how do we do that safely and securely? Absolutely. Now, we have a question here uh, that, that uh, I'd like to read this question from, from our attendees. It says, if culturally and functionally, persons seldomly participate digitally in other aspects and services, would this not undermine the success of the digital banking revolution? Additionally, what are the other inputs outside of banking that are necessary to make this revolution a success? Maybe George um, yes, this would is, like to tackle this one. Yes, that's a, an excellent question and, and really along the lines where, I, um, where, where, where my mind was at this stage. So I want to say good morning to everyone. Good morning, um, colleagues, comrades, and um, good morning to, to all um, the viewers and participants in the, in the webinar. Um, I think, you know, the, the, the concept of if you build it, they will come is, is, is it doesn't apply because, you know, having worked in the wallet space and, and seeing the action out in Europe, Middle East and Africa, even here um, and in North America, um, the thing is you have to fixate and focus on what does the customer need. We can have the best legislation and networks and capabilities, but what is the problem you're solving? What does the customer really need? And, and they, they call it design thinking these days. That's, the, that's the, the, the new wrapping for it. But really, what is the problem we're trying to solve? And then, and, 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 and part of that is engaging with the different segments of the customers, right? So whether it's what we call baby boomers, which would be people over 60 years old, or the, um, the Gen Xers, which is, you know, maybe from 40 to 60, or the, the, the millennials on the 40s, and, and now the, 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 the Gen Zers, or, or, or Y, or whatever, whatever. Um, you, you have to understand what people want. So for me, in the Caribbean, the advantage we have is that, yes, we can say we are behind the curve in terms of the use of digital technologies, but the reality is we have had a panoramic view of what has been playing out on the world stage. Many of us have PayPal accounts. We've seen Stripe. We've seen Square. We've seen what is happening in Hong Kong and China. Um, we've a lot of us have heard about M-Pesa in Kenya, you know, the, the, the African brothers and sisters, what they're doing out there. Um, and I've had some experience in um, interacting in, when I, in my stint on that side of the planet. Um, let me see what North America has done, what Europe has done. And now we're at a stage where, so before it was kind of conceptual and I don't want to say nice to have, because if you're not financially included, I mean, it impacts you on a day-to-day -day basis. But with the pandemic, it is no longer a nice to have or something we're going to get to in a couple of years. What you're seeing is there's a need. I mean, the, the creatives have no festivals. 
Trinidad or Trini brothers and sisters got, got out before this broke, so Trinidad Carnival happened, but the artists in Barbados, in St. Lucia, Dominica, the, you know, Grenada, across the Caribbean, Jamaica, they have, no, they have no carnival this year. There's no crop over, there's no festival. So that's, that's where all their earning happens. All, all the creatives and the, 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 um, the, the SMEs surrounding such festivals. You know, there was no reggae festival here last month, right? That's a big thing, right? So it now drives us to digital. Even the brick and mortar uh, retailers, supermarkets, and so on. You know, I, I never knew there was a, such a thing as grocery couriers here. You know, um, when you have an American Express, they talk about courier services, or when you work for a .com or out in um, Silicon Valley, in Google and stuff, they're legendary for couriering things, like your laundry. And I've worked on a project where they were doing laundry stuff, pick up for Dell and so on. So you, you see that, that's something out there. I didn't even know people used to go shopping for you. I had to know that when we were all on lockdown slash um, house arrest, right? What that means is that digitization is thrust upon us. So we get to, there's a need and we need to address that need. So as we lay out the infrastructure, and I know government here is doing an excellent job in terms of looking at legislation, data privacy, information security slash cybersecurity, and, and all the enabling legislations, those are actively being discussed here and in other islands in the Caribbean, um, Jamaica, um, the Dutch Caribbean, um, the, the, the EC islands. Um, and you know, here we have a national digital ID initiative that's ongoing where everyone will have um, a digital identification which will enable easier access to services and, finance and finances. So the foundational underpinnings are there. But again, if the foundation is not, if we're not fixating and focusing on the problem that we need to solve, which is the ability for a person to gain access to the value that is due them and to be able to move it around to, to achieve their greater good, right? Irrespective of who and where they are in society, whether they have a bank account or not. So we have a lot of tools and we have a lot of use cases and examples. You know, we have Estonia, we have um, Dubai, UAE, where I lived for a few years. We have Sweden, where, 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 where um, you know, without, without I mean, they're, they're doing a digital kroner, but even before that, they, they, they transitioned to a space where they were taking out ATMs, right? Um, so it makes you think. So as much as we, we understand the power of, 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 of um, digital currencies and so on, you know, and Sweden certainly is looking at that, but they have really operated on the pools of value kind of thing. So as, so as long as I have access to my money, my value, the number that represents how much value I have to manipulate, then it's okay. Whether it's digitized paper or not, I'm not seeing the paper. I'm not seeing the coin. It's sitting in an account. I have access to it in the palm of my hand, right? The bank is in my hand and I can move it. Whether I call it a a mobile bank and a wallet, doesn't matter, internet banking, I am able to access that which is due me so that I can feed my family. I can, you know, maybe indulge in a little bling if I feel like I can go and party and get a drink. Socially distanced, of course. Um, so bringing all that home, we're at a place where it's no longer an option whether we digitize. It, we have to because of the new normal, um, during the pandemic and even post pandemic. And, um, it, 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 you know, like I said, we have a palette. The world is, is there for us to see what works, what doesn't work. And we have to take our cultural norms into account. What works in Estonia, what works in Singapore, what works in the USA isn't necessarily going to work in Barbados. And what works in Barbados won't work in Jamaica, right? It's different. It, it depends on, the, on, on, on who we are as a people. So like I said, as we implement, we have to really think about what the people want and how they want to receive what they want. So that, that's, that's, my, um, that's my thought. Excellent. 
George, thank you so much for, for that uh, uh, amazing answer to the question. I think you captured that um, uh, thank you. In, a very, in very good form indeed. So we realize that uh, culturally, this, this may be a challenge for us, but it is a need for us. And I think that, that we've seen the need uh, throughout this period of time where we've been you know, in, uh, under house arrest in this, in this lockdown <laughs> uh, time, as it were. Now, what we've done is so far, we, we've covered kind of like from a, a top, that we're kind of like at the top now looking at global and regional payments. And we've delved a little bit deeper into what's happening on the ground. But we have a question here, which I think is, is very important uh, from, from one of the attendees. And, and this, is, this is regarding uh, a, a regional um, network. It's saying, does this eliminate the need for correspondent banking, which has been quite a challenge for the Eastern Caribbean currency area? Right. So, so maybe uh, Brad or or Patrick or anybody would like to answer that. Yeah, I'll, I'll take a take a quick um, response to that. When you talk about who the stakeholders are in a payments ecosystem, you have regulated financial institutions, regulators, um, businesses, individuals. These are all participants in the ecosystem, and so you know, correspondent bank is is also a participant. In, in the ecosystem. And so a proper design of an improved payment system, like George mentioned, when you're talking about what is the problem you're trying to solve, what you're really doing is, is delivering an improved version of a, of a payment ecosystem that works for all of the stakeholders. You can't stop and say, oh, well, it works for the individual on the street, but it doesn't work for the correspondent bank or it doesn't work for a regulator. You have to really talk about the design and its ramifications end to end and improvement. And so understanding and identifying all of the stakeholders, all of their needs and how, that, how they work together to improve the payment system end to end is really what, what this is all about. And you can't do it, you, you need some lab experiences, but you need to bring those lab experiences out into the real world and start delivering those improvements. And it, and it does take time and it takes work um, and it takes engagement from everybody that's participating, including regulated financial institutions and regulators, um, businesses and consumers. And, and you look at the design and say, yeah, we're, we're improving the system and, and we can take this out of the lab and start putting it into um, our, our payments ecosystem and show that it delivers the way that that it was designed to deliver. And that's really what this is all about. Absolutely. Um, Patrick? Yeah, I'd, I'd like to weigh in on the correspondent banking issue. What it does is that it actually makes correspondent banks more relevant, and then they come on board much faster and easier and quicker. It justifies their business case. And um, the correspondent banks would become more active and actually want to wish to set up uh, satellite banks or branches in Barbados and the Caribbean. So the answer would be it becomes a more dynamic, beneficial relationship between the correspondent banks, the, the merchants, the customers on the ground in the Caribbean, the customers in the U.S. There's more trade activity. Uh, and, and, and so the entire process, the entire relationship process, building process of that um, becomes, it, it takes a different turn. There's a completely different dynamic to it because rather than, than, than becoming a stalemate component, it becomes a more engaging component. There is more positive movement toward each other for the uh, correspondent banks to come to the Caribbean and then for uh, business activity to go through those correspondent banks through the U.S. and through the rest of the world. So the answer would be that it becomes a more engaging future for both sites. Absolutely. And what... Uh, another uh, interesting point is, I think when people in the Caribbean look at correspondent banks, it's always as a gateway to do international transactions. Uh, but correspondent banks, as, as we know, have many functions outside of, of simply uh, uh, carrying transactions. So as Patrick said, this would allow us to have much better relations because we would be using a a regulated and compliant platform um, that these correspondent banks 
capitalists would be happy with, right? Um, sure. there, there's another uh, a question uh, th uh, that we've had, and this is in relation to uh, central bank issued digital currencies. Again, we're still at that macro level. And if we have uh, a governments and, and central banks in the region issuing their own central bank digital currency and, and maintaining that sovereignty of, sovereignty of currency, how would this um, be used in an open payment network? Uh, is it compatible? Um, like how, how would trade take place so, between regions? So let, let, can I, if I don't, if you don't mind, can I take on um, the initial, can I know Brad and Patrick are chomping at the bit, um, <laughs> but I, I, I'll just say, say my, my, my two cents. When, when you look across the world, I mean, I keep saying looking across the world, but the reality is, we, we are saying the word central bank digital currency because of Facebook. Facebook, you know, threw the blood in the water, threw down the gauntlet, whatever you want to call it, they, they, they shot the starting gun. And they said, we're issuing Libra. We all know that Facebook has 2.5 billion registered users across the world. And, and uh, I don't know the percentage activation, but a significant percentage of that are active. So if they issue their own digital currency, this Libra, what does that do to economies? Now, I can tell you, and, and, and let's, let's, let's just step back and uh, for a little bit of history in, in payments and so on, the, the whole digital wallet, mobile wallet thing started, I believe, um, in, in, in Mozambique, but it really got going, and, 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 and folk, the historians can correct me, in Kenya with M-Pesa. Safaricom and um, their parent company, Vodafone, was my client at one stage. They launched this wallet. And for the first time in history, a telephone company knew the financial position of a country better than its own central bank, right? So we know if Libra does what it's supposed to do for them, for, for Facebook, it can be interesting. So as a result, you've seen almost all of the major central banks in the world, whether they were before cautiously just dipping their toe in the water, all of them have announced um, CB, CD central bank, um, DC central bank digital currency projects, right? Um, pilots and so on and so forth. So, but, but there, I think for the casual user, you must just understand that all a central bank issued digital currency is a representation of the paper and coin that you use today. That is all that it is. Rather than having to mint stuff or print stuff on official paper and issue it banknotes and, and coins, there, there is a digital representation of that that sits on highly secured servers somewhere distributed down to um, the retail banks, just as the central bank would distribute um, paper and coin um, in, in, in the analog world, right? There's a debate as to whether that is necessary because today, currency is digitized. How much money do, for us that are banked, I mean, the, for, the, for those that are unbanked or underbanked, it's different, but for us that are banked, how much paper money do you have in your pocket today? You have a card, you have a piece of plastic, and you accept the pools of value. So then you will say that the digital currency, the central bank issued digital currency, will be targeted at the underbanked and the unbanked so that they have the ability to also digitally or using plastic, using their mobile phone, access their money. Um, if they don't have a bank account, they don't have access to cards. Well, one could argue that there are card solutions that could be issued that could solve that, right? Again, this is, we're in the experimental phase. You know, I'm being provocative because we have not landed this plane yet, right? It's all still being worked out. But nonetheless, whether we're using digital currencies, digital representations of fiat, or we're stuck with 
paper and coin, the network is the same because it's moving value. Those are just representations of the value. The government issued representations of the value. So don't think that the network just happens because there, there's, there's a CBDC, CBCD. Um, I, I keep messing up the acronym, Central Bank Digital Currency. It is necessary as long as there are pools of value, right? And um, coming back to the usability piece, the question is, when you have these central bank digital currencies, will the average person, the grandma, the grandfather, the, the, the man on the street that is, that is breaking his back to earn a living on a work site, selling in retail or whatever, is he or she going to be comfortable interacting with that? I think that's the more pressing question. Now, how does one get the average person to understand this is secure um, and, 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 and this is the way to go? Because I do believe that that's the demographic such things are targeted at because the bank already don't need all, most of the time to utilize paper or coin. They have cards and many, many places accept cards. And if they don't, they can go to an ATM and get the money and, and do what they have to do, yep. right? So I, I, that, I would, I'm yeah. just putting that there as a provocateur here. So Great stuff. Can I, can I respond to that just a second? Absolutely. I, I think George has brought up some really important points. And that's why when you talk about, you know, when he says a wallet, I, I don't know what that evokes for everybody else. Um, when we say bank account, that evokes a, an image in people's head about what that means. When you say a, a digital wallet, that may or may not evoke something that has meaning for somebody. And so we use these terms and, and that's why we use the term digital currency um, and digital fiat because it evokes something for somebody about how things work, right? But if you take away all that terminology and you said, what are we really trying to do? We're really trying to build a network design that is improved, right? We're trying to get rid of the things that are overhead that don't make for improvement. For example, we know it's, it's really super important that if, if my payment card number gets stolen that I have a right to do a chargeback and dispute that. But those are, those are authorized funds where you're authorizing the transaction itself. You're not necessarily authorized that the individual cardholder isn't authorizing that transaction. And so when you say, what if we take the authorization and move it away from the authorization of the money to the authorization of the individual making the payment to approve that payment ahead of time, as opposed to authorized funds. And so when you're designing next generation payment systems, yeah, you use some terms that say maybe wallet or you know digital fiat, but what you really wanna do is say, well, how does authorization work? How is the end user protected? What are the uh, protections for a central bank in terms of their role in the economy, right? Which is crucial. Um, we don't want to go and say, well, we don't want any central banks. Um, they've had a core function. Their, that function is, is regionally important for um, those areas, right? And the same with regulated financial institutions. We're not saying that, you know, a bank account or a wallet is better. We're simply saying, how do we deliver improvements? And yes, we have to anchor that to something like a wallet, a digital fiat, but in the end, what we want is what George described, which is how does the money move? How does the improvement occur? And how is it done safely and securely? And how do all the stakeholders, what is their role? Um, one of the individuals that we work with often says, um, at, the, at the Federal Reserve often says, who does what to whom in the payment system? And you think about it like, what's the central bank's role, right? And what's the regulated financial institution's role? And what's the role of the business? And what's the role of the consumer? And who does what to whom? That's really what you're working out when you're designing a payment system and thinking about payment system improvement. Absolutely. Now, we, we have a thank you very much, uh, Brad and, and George, for, for those uh, wonderful explanations there. Uh, one of the things that you touched on was the security aspect. And we recognize we're, you know, we're in this point of transition from 
paper to digital, whether it's cards or whatever. But that means that people are now not going to have a whole bunch of cash walking around in their pocket or whatever. And, and we've already moved away from that. So criminals now are going to have a very different approach to taking your money than sticking you up with a gun and taking your cash. So we've got an interesting question here. And it says, exciting news for Barbados as a home port for this and the Caribbean. What about the data security implementation, compliance by businesses and training of employee and employers on this critical aspect for change? Okay, um, let, me, let me weigh in on that one, please. Um, so as we digitize, as we go virtual, the same threats we have in the physical world make them make their way into the virtual world. So someone isn't going to show up with an automatic weapon or a Glock or something. Uh, I, I mean, what, what are they going to point it at? But, you know, they, they're going to try to intrude on you. Um, if you have a smart TV, then you have to take certain precautions. <laughs> Otherwise, somebody could be watching you. Um, similarly, with your bank account, of course, if, and, and they're well-documented cases in the media um, of breaches and so on. And, but the thing is, in a technology world in, or in a technology-driven world, in the virtual world, if we are thoughtful, if we are methodical, if we follow the industry best practices, like um, the NIST, that um, is from North America, um, or the OSI framework from Europe, um, th there are things you can do around understanding your risk because the same, when you go to set up a, a brick and mortar bank or credit union, you do a study of what do I need to do to secure this place, right? You do, of course you do. You have protocols, you badge people, you did, certain places people can't go. You, you do background checks on any, any and everybody um, irrespective of level. And it's the same thing in the digital space. You have to do your risk assessments. You have to do your awareness. Customers, when you see an email from, make sure you know who it's from. If it's a weird looking email and, and, and it has attachments, just delete it. If you click on that thing, somebody is going to try to get on your machine, uh, whether you have virus protection or not, and then they're going to do things to you, right? Think about use of VPNs. There's some basic, just like in the, in, 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 the, in the real world, there's some basic hygiene things you do. You, you know, maybe in, in certain places, you drive with your windows up, you keep the car doors locked. You don't walk around with your cash in your hand, brandishing it, because there's certain basic things we learn as kids up to adulthood to de-risk ourselves in the physical world. And there's certain rules and legislations and regulations around how people do things, how retailers do things, how utilities do, how every actor in the society does things to, 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 to manage the societal risk. That level of thinking is being translated now into the cyber world. So I think, yes, there, there are risks, but to me, and, and some people may want to crucify me for saying this, but I don't think the risks are any greater. They're just coming from a different angle and we have to be, we have to take the precautions because in a lot of ways, we've been very cavalier about cybersecurity. We, we, the, the kind of precautions we take in the physical world, we haven't taken in the, in the, in the cyber world. And I mean, once upon a time, people like Kevin Mitnick and, 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 and Brad, you will know who that is. I, I, I'm not sure. You'd have to be a gearhead to know who he is, right? But he was a folk hero, a great hacker. And it was like, wow, wow. But he was taking real money from real people, right? Um, should I have called his name? It's, it's out there. It's in the pub. But what I'm trying to say is that hackers were once revered. Today, is the average Joe is now a bit afraid of them because you begin to see the pain and suffering when somebody compromises your phone, somebody compromises your email. All of us have had friends call us up and say, you, you sent a weird email. Was that you? Right? Um, so there is, there, 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 there is awareness for um, end consumers. There's awareness for people in every level of organizations, governments, and so on. 
once we are thoughtful and surgical, I think we manage the risk. And it's no more risky than brick and mortar. Absolutely. Just to, just to add one piece to what he said, which I think is an important emphasis, is that we're doing all that we can to improve security online, and, and we should. Um, you know, with technologies and a com combination of capabilities. Ultimately, though, I think George brought up an interesting point is there's this element of education, the human that's a part of it. Nobody can protect um, my account if I give out my password and credentials for authentication freely or post it on Facebook. So there's this element of we need to educate people about what security and how to keep things secure. Uh, the human piece of that, as well as the technological piece. And George is right, the, the attacks are going to continue to come from various directions. And so security is a journey. It's not a destination. You don't ever arrive there and say, we're secure. Your attacks and your threats are always going to come from a different angle, attacking your vulnerabilities. And so it's a constant effort to engage people on how to stay safe and secure online as well as a combination of capabilities that are resisting um, attacks and threats. Excellent. Those, those, those are tremendous. Can I weigh in here as well? Uh, Absolutely. Discuss this component. Um, you know, I, I am one who loves to read all kinds of literature. And in the Book of Wisdom, it literally says, right, I was old. I was young, sorry, but now I'm old. And then uh, the psalmist uh, added, a virtue to it by saying but i've never seen the righteous forsaken right or his seed begging bread but can i extract from i was young and now i'm old right uh in the journey as brad said and and uh george uh those two guys are really on today they're really doing well i'm listening here enjoying it i'm wondering if i should say any more but I, i'd like to weigh in and say that you know the the, the tools now that will uh not carry your money and I want to say this to the older folk, the younger folk, those who are listening, because I, I, I made to understand that we have a wide listenership. So you need to know, as the consumer know, what does this mean for me? How does this, as a risk component, evaluate itself for me? And I want to just touch on that real quick, because you're important. This is all for you. And when the, the writer said, you know, I was young and now I'm old, you know what? Today... Uh, we are using smartphones, right? And that is a generational uh, tool that is going to be uh, known to people 20 years from now who will not be uh, 40 and 30. Then you add 20 years to that person's life and whatever that means to your uh, age now, that's what it is. So you were young and this journey is going to find you on this uh, uh, vehicle at a different age in tomorrow's tomorrow, right? So today, we are introducing a new concept, how to secure better your money, okay? So Brad and George touched on it about losing your wallet. So what is losing your wallet today? Today, your wallet is cash, cards that are in that wallet stuck in, right? Tomorrow, that wallet could be something that you can download uh, from a, a remote location if, for example, someone even steals your phone. If someone steals your physical wallet, there are protocols that will be developed with this new tech um, that as you and I grow with this technology, as Brad uh, correctly stated, that it's a journey that will make your money more secure. That's what this is all about. And we want to give Barbados and the wonderful people of the Caribbean access to this journey in a way that is cutting edge that is at the forefront first class business class travel in this journey right you are the 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 the, the focus of this journey and you're not someone who is being taken for granted as a matter of fact in this journey uh, that brad and george and, and and roland are talking about you're at the forefront because wherever the technology is going no you have the opportunity and this is a very unique opportunity to be at the very beginning, the front end, the luxury class version of it. That's where you are. So the developmental thoughts that are going into this, 
the ideas that are going to be coming out of this that, that are going to be captured and spread and, and uh, utilized. All those brilliant students of the University of the West Indies, I want you to know that this journey includes your thoughts, your ideas, and it's going to capture the brilliant uh, innovations that you will come up with. We, we guarantee you that's what this is all about. This is the most exciting journey that you could ever imagine, right? Because currency, that thing that circulates, that goes from one place to the next, that takes value around the world, around the globe, you are now being introduced in a way that has never been seen before, right? In a way that, has, that is going to transform the world. This is not just talk, no. You are being invited to that platform of change and change management uh, that will change the world forever and ever. That, that is very uh, exciting indeed. And, and, ahead, and Ro, Ro, I, I, I want to add something there. Um, and it really is probably reflecting back to the, the previous question and, and, and um, adding on because as Patrick was speaking, it occurred to me. In reality, the, this digitization journey, whether we're using central bank digital currencies or we're making people's funds accessible to them via cards, via wallets, whatever. It is taking cash off the street and rendering everyone safer, right? Because again, you, 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 you can speak about the threats and, 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 and the cyber and so on. But if we're thoughtful, if we take the necessary preventive measures and we, we understand, we have the awareness, that is one level. The person getting to your money is is, is harder than if you have a physical leather wallet walking down the street. All someone has to do is press a gun on you or a knife and say, look, give it to me. If they take your phone, I mean, provided they don't physically harm you, you make one call and boom, the funds are frozen, right? In fact, they got to go through so many two-factor authentication, all that kind of stuff, you know, different passwords, pins, and so on, is harder. So I, I want to put out there to take away the fear factor from or help people process this better, irrespective of wherever you sit in the society. And as I said earlier, whether we're going to go use digital currency or we're using the pools of what I call the pools of value concept, i.e., folks use cards and wallets to attach to, attach to wherever they have their money. Um, either way, whichever way wins in the end is going to be for a better society, a better, safer society, and, and, and it will give us a much better experience as we transact, do transactions in our day-to-day -day lives. Absolutely. Uh, thank you very much, George, Patrick, and Brad, for those uh, wonderful explanations. Now, we've got questions rolling in. Uh, we've got people who joined this call, attending this from all over the world, including Africa. Our friends in Africa, you know, here in the Caribbean, we, we have uh, a deep history. Uh, we consider ourselves extended Africa, as it were. If you turn Barbados upside down, it looks just like Africa. <laughs> so, so there's a lot, a lot of synergies there. Now, the, the question is, I am from Kenya. And I am happy to hear M-Pesa being mentioned. Given the unprecedented success of M-Pesa, why do you think it has not grown outside East Africa? I'd like a, like a very like, succinct answer to this because I'd like to move on to some other questions. Um, would anybody, George, would you I, like to tackle I, that? I, I, yes. So, and I mean, because I, I, I was under NDA for some things, but I do know that there is a particular... West African country that my company at the time, we attempted to partner with one of the local telephone company, local MNOs. And we met with the deputy governor of the central bank of that country. Um, it's an Anglophone, <laughs> it's most of it is an Anglophone uh, 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 West African country. And the deputy governor said, look, you see what happened with Safari Common and Pace in Kenya? We're not letting that happen here. So you will not, you can come, and I, I was with an American firm, you guys can come, we welcome you. Partner with a law firm, partner with whatever you wanna partner with, you will not partner with a telco. Because there was a concern that the telco 
you know, across the country has access to way more persons than even the central bank because almost everybody has a phone, irrespective of socioeconomic demographic, right? So I think there's some, that, that's one barrier there. Uh, another thing is, um, and I mean, and, 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 and I, I'm just relating what my peer at the time who was from uh, a, a, a Southern African country, let me put it that way, and he came to us after having led one of the, apart from MPSO ones, one of the more successful wallet companies. And he said that his approach was very grassroots. He said, look, a lot of these companies go to the cities and think that's where you do it. But in his country, he went into the hinterland and he met with the different ethnic groupings, the, the tribal heads and so on, and got buy-in at that grassroots level. So when the kids went off to university or when they went to the city to work, you know, the elders are telling them, you will send money home to me on the phone. So he told me that the reason why a lot of the wallets across Africa are not working is because you're not following, you're not following the use case. You actually have to get in to the, to understand the movements of people and how the money is moving. So th that's what he told me. And, and that was what he practiced. So I'm just based on that. I'm just saying, I believe that is why you haven't seen, those are some of the reasons. One, I think, that whatever was done in Kenya was the first off. It was novel. It solved a lot of problems at the time. And boom, it became a phenomenon. And maybe the people that the Safaricom, et cetera, who ran it didn't really understand what happened to them and just tried to do what they did there at a very basic level without consciously being aware of why they were successful. Right? I suspect mm -hmm. that. And what happened there the way how that wallet propagated, the needs in Barbadian and Caribbean society, the societies are a bit different, similar in some ways, but very different in others. So, like I said, you have to, you have to go towards the need, not the technology, to understand what the people want and how they want to get what they want and then give it to them. So, you learn, borrow from the technology of MPSA, but, 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 but figure yeah. out how you need to use it in your particular circumstance. Roland, I want to just quickly weigh in on this, right? Um, last year, um, uh, early in the year, I was in Africa, uh, the West Coast, and we met with several of the uh, foreign ministers and leaders of the African nations, right? And you know some of the things that came out of it. We discussed that at a higher level. Um, but what I can say is that a fix is coming for my colleagues in Kenya, for my colleagues in West Africa and South Africa, and East Africa, a fix is coming. We are discussing things at the very highest levels. And that's what I can say. There's a lot that I cannot say in that regard, but we've met with the leaders of foreign ministers of many of the countries and um, a fix is coming. And so there is going to be a revolutionary thing. That's a good thing because we're looking at unifying and instead of separating people, we're going to bring them together so they can participate better in the economic spaces. Um, I can hint to you that uh, President Obama, he went to um, the uh, Western African nations and there's the NBA there, basketball, sports works, right? And there's more sports coming. There are more ideas coming. There's more unity coming. There's a lot of fun coming. And uh, just keep your, let's, 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 uh, I was going to use a, a parable from Africa, but uh, let me just say that Tanis is an African name. Tanis itself is an African name. And I bear on my melanin skin the, the, the evidence that I am from Africa. I'm not going to leave my African brothers and sisters out. There is unity coming. There, is, there are better days coming. And just hang in there while we fix the Caribbean. We're coming for you soon thereafter, okay? Fantastic, Patrick. It sounds like a Joseph moment. Fantastic. Uh, here, and I think this is, is very um, uh, pertinent because, uh, and, and I'll, I'll just give a little background on the, the question is, what are the constraints for deployment and rapid adoption? Now we had an economy and decent work in the digital economy 
workshop last year. And what came out of this was, was some of the constraints were actually that didn't understand the technology and that were holding things back. So would somebody like to tackle that? What are the constraints for deployment and rapid adoption? What are your thoughts? So if you look at, if you look at the characteristics of what you need to, to be successful to achieve ubiquity, you need, you need rapid adoption. And that rapid adoption has to occur across all stakeholder segments, across consumers, across businesses, which means you have to align the incentives for participation. You can't alienate one segment and achieve um, rapid adoption of the platform. So it's a very tough thing. It's like balancing um, security with access, right? Those are always in tension. The most secure things have zero access. Right, what we want is simple access, but highly secure, and that's where the tension is. What we want is ubiquity, right, with rapid deployment. Well, you have to scale rapidly, which means you have to balance what are the incentives for all the stakeholders to engage. And to do that, you have to think about regulators, regulated financial institutions, businesses and individuals, central banks, the whole participating thing, and design this design has to be carefully um, constructed so that the incentives are aligned for all parties to, to participate and get that rapid adoption and ubiquity because that's when you really achieve um, improvement is when you have a next generation capability that delivers value across all stakeholder segments. Fantastic, thank you. Now we've, we've got a, an interesting question here from a, a legal and regulatory perspective. It says the Caribbean has a number of legal and regulatory gaps with regard to privacy and data protection. Less than 15% of countries have privacy regulations in place. Given that processing of personal and sensitive data is at the core of digital payments, how do we get Caribbean governments to understand the urgency of legislative reform as a pillar of digital payments? Perhaps I can jump in and uh, look at that. Um, there are steps being taken at governmental level in CARICOM, and then within CARICOM, uh, within the CARICOM space, you will see that the leaders of the governments have adopted a move to move closer and closer towards a Caribbean uh, court system, Caribbean Court of Appeal, currently based in our neighboring uh, brother or sister island of Trinidad, right? And so the Caribbean is, is viewing its, its existence in a way that it is morphing into a more uh, easily business-centered uh, region. We have about, what, 19 islands or whatever the, the number is. Uh, I believe the future holds a space for Cuba, and for, for um, the Dominican Republic, for, you know, the Caribbean, as we see it now, is going to become more integrated. And that's why the, the thinkers in our education system in Barbados, for example, uh, thought it necessary to learn both French and Spanish. But guess what? French and Spanish are the languages that are in the islands and the territories are all around us. So these, these visionary planners that, that, that preceded us knew that we needed to integrate better, right? So having put that there in the framework, the foundation of where we are going as a people, the regulatory frameworks will come out of the leadership that we have. I mean, I, I'm very impressed with the leaders that we have seen emerging in Barbados. We've seen some of the world's leaders, not just of, of a small 166 square mile country. Look at our prime minister has been leading the challenge across the globe in this COVID thing, speaking and directing and sharing. And the, the, the leadership in Barbados took a, an interesting turn. Ladies are everywhere. Ladies that are doing a phenomenal job, right? The, the leader of the Chamber of Commerce is a lady. The, pri the Prime Minister is a lady. Her deputy is a lady. Uh, Sadia Bradshaw, the Honorable. Uh, and we have the Governor General of Barbados, uh, the right excellent, the excellent, uh, Her Excellency, I'm sorry, uh, Sandra Mason. We have ladies who are functioning. We have passed out the rest of the world in our leadership structures here in Barbados. And we don't have a problem with ladies leading. We don't have a problem with innovation. We don't have a problem with looking at things and coming up with logical solutions without prejudice, uh, without issues that are relating that other countries are struggling with. And so having said that, 
ideas that are going to bear fruit and that are going to develop the region. Uh, we in Barbados are quite happy to lead the charge on ideas that work, ideas that bring sustainable value. It is going to happen. I can tell you this, right? I frequently speak with our prime minister. Uh, not only are we friends from, from childhood, but we are friends and, and, you know, it is known that, yes, I am, in a sense, an advisor to her. And what we can say is this. The way forward is going to have an integrated Caribbean. You've heard her speak that. I can echo that as an outsider in politics in a sense, but in, in, a, in a true sense, a Caribbean man. We are looking at the future in a way that is going to revolutionize what we've experienced before, which was good, I must say it was good, but it's gonna be better. And the Caribbean region, we are going to see a better future, integrating, working together, and monetary policy that echoes, okay, the, the steps forward are going to be put into the frameworks of governance that you see coming forward, uh, even as uh, CARICOM's leaders are, are saying that they're going to follow on on the leadership that Prime Minister Motley has, has given. Uh, the next in line in a few uh, days will be the Honorable Ralph Gonzalez, very close to me as well. And he and his deputy, um, uh, Sir Louis Straker, are very close to me, very, very close. And we are going to see a continuation of that leadership going forward in this Caribbean and the CARICOM. Patrick, if I could ask you a question there, how does what we're about to do in the Caribbean, how does this affect Africa and the rest of the world? How does it bring us all closer together? Well, let me just share a story uh, before I give you the meat on the bones on that one, right? Uh, one of the things I did, I was taken to um, uh, Cotonou, Benin, with Kelly Wright uh, from Fox News. We went there together around this time last year, and we met with Romain Zanou, um, brilliant man, right? And while we were there, they, they took me to the place where we left um, and, and came to Barbados and I think some went to Brazil. And let me tell you, I, I was overwhelmed. I, I cried. I, I mean, I, I, I didn't, I wept in a way that I don't think I knew I could have, um, seeing that our people left. And then the hugs and the, the, the embrace uh, moments between us and our Caribbean, uh, Caribbean, uh, we, are, we are the Josephs, as you said, but our African colleagues, it, it demonstrated that there is healing that has taken place there. And so what we're going to do in developing the Caribbean, and you, uh, I don't know if you want to put any links to it, but I can tell you that I preceded the ambassadorial ties and all the their various ties that happened between Barbados and Africa. Yes, I was there first and calls were made and certain hands were shook. Uh, that's all I, I can say. But what we can say is that Africa is at the forefront of the Caribbean moves today. Uh, 400 years have now passed between the slaves coming and where we are now, 400 years. And I think the number four is significant. Uh, and it's, it's a time, it, it shows up in history in, in transformational uh, 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 moments and the transformation of the relationship between Africa and the Caribbean and the United States there's, 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 there's so many great days ahead. The, the specific things that we can look at are four areas. Uh, let me just, just look, at, look at them here really quickly. Monetary, uh, diplomacy, of course. We're looking at the cultural components. And then here's where it gets exciting a lot, right? A lot, a lot of excitement comes here, the travel components. Now, if you're moving people around, there's currency, there's culture, there is, um, there, everything is captured. Diplomacy, everything has to happen there. And as we see those movements, we're going to see that the Caribbean cannot starve. Food, food movements will, will occur. And there, there will be benefits that will uh, cause the Caribbean and Africa to become close again. The wealth of Africa, the ideas of its Joseph's people will be uh, shipping back and forth. And we solve problems as Africans over here in the Caribbean. And in the U.S., I mean, you look at all the various things in the U.S., uh, George Washington himself came to Barbados and he wrote in his annals that he was inspired to form the United States when he left and went. The person who uh, uh, cured the civil rights and segregation problems was born in Barbados, the David Augustus Straker, um, the person who desegregated nurses in the United States was a Barbadian-born woman, Mabel Keaton Stoppers. So... I can say that um, Barbados and the Caribbean 
will influence the U.S. some more. The, the first black senator in, the, in North America was born in Barbados. I mean, these are things that, that need to be known. Um, the, the future between Africa, the United States, and the Caribbean, Barbados, I believe, and I, I'm sorry, my other Caribbean colleagues, but Barbados is the epicenter of that. Uh, we are the first place that people landed from Africa. Guess what? We are the place that will cause the solutions to, to resonate, right, uh, from here. And so this is that moment of time. It's going to be exciting. That's what I can say. Very powerful words indeed, uh, Patrick. Very powerful. Thank you. So we can see that uh, from what Patrick is saying there, uh, the, the technology shifts that we're going to see here in the Caribbean and the networks that we're going to be, that we're going to put in place, these digital frameworks, they're going to be open and they're going to allow for connectivity between our countries, between in this region and internationally. So this is going to bring us closer together and it's going to facilitate trade and industry. And Barbados uh, can be at the center of this uh, in, in terms of uh, utilizing its treaty network and, and the facility of this open payment network that, that will be implemented. So this is something um, uh, very good indeed. And also looking at the long, rich history and friendship that we have uh, between Barbados, the United States, the UK, and, and everywhere else. And, and, and this is amazing. Thank you. So we've got a few other questions here. Uh, and, and maybe uh, uh, we can have Brad to tackle this one. Uh, this question says, later this year, Brazil is about to launch an instant payment system that was developed by the Central Bank of Brazil. I believe it is called uh, PIX. It says QR based. The system will confirm transactions within a few seconds, 24 uh, seven days a week, including holidays. What are the regulatory hurdles we have to overcome in Barbados in order to for Barbados to lead payment systems tech that would allow more inclusion and entrepreneurship? Yeah, the regulatory hurdles are interesting. Um, regulation usually falls behind technology innovation. So regulators are usually trying to keep up with innovations and provide um, the purpose of regulation is to make sure that innovations aren't abusing consumers or, or businesses, right? So when you talk about the previous question of privacy, right, and privacy policies lagging behind what's actually happening, the way to address that is to uh, allow for innovation, but you, you want to allow for innovation and set best practices that protect privacy, um, that that regulation isn't actually gonna, gonna drive technological advancement. What you wanna do is have the regulation not stifle technological advancement, but provide guidance to it. And that's a very, very tough thing to do. The way that happens is through education, through understanding what the technological advancements are, just to talk about how we are achieving this in the US, the Federal Reserve organized industry stakeholders, 330 plus industry stakeholders, and had a year and a half effort to talk about end-to-end -end payment system improvement in the US. First thing they did was effectiveness criteria and said, if we benchmark a solution, how do we know that that solution is delivering improvement end-to-end, -end, right? Not just one segment for person-to-person -person transactions or business-to-business, -business, but end-to-end -end for all use cases. And then they had solution proposers come forward and present that. Now, this is one of the chief regulators in the U.S. that's leading this initiative. And so they're very plugged into what payment system improvements are occurring in the U.S. They're interacting with um, the innovators that are bringing these solutions so that they're understanding what's happening. And it's, it, it's in essence, they're trying to, to march regulatory improvements right along with innovation improvement. And that's a tough thing to do. It means your, your regulators have to be plugged in and understanding issues. And um, usually means regulators have to have time as well. But that, the, 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 the lead that the Fed is taking in the US and that the central bank is taking in Barbados is certainly appropriate. Uh, the central bank of Barbados had a conference on digital currencies, central bank digital currencies organized. Um, those kinds of things are exactly what have to happen 
to make sure that regulation is parallel with innovation and there's not abuse of consumers and businesses in the design of the technology. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you, Brad. So we've got a, a, another question here, but there's a, a, a point that I'd like to make um, from, from a local payments perspective for each of our Caribbean countries here. And because uh, we're in Barbados right now, we can speak to the issues that we're facing in Barbados. Uh, we have one, a number of physical cash transactions, but we also have a number of checks being issued, right? And we have so many checks being issued that it, it becomes a strain on the system. And prior to, to COVID, uh, we had uh, in the region of about 90,000 checks issued by our national insurance scheme alone per month. And I'm sure it's gone up considerably with the number of people that are unemployed at the moment. Uh, that doesn't include uh, checks issued by the Barbados Revenue Authority, and this is all government. And, and that doesn't include uh, companies that are issuing checks and so forth. So with with a system like the open payment network a system that's that's open now how can we solve some of these problems that, that we have with with the amount of checks coming into the system uh the the problem of the, of handling physical paper like that <coughs> queuing up at banks to get these deposited and then the challenges that the banks face in processing these how, how would the opn solve this yeah, the way, the way you solve that with the network design is allow for safe and secure delivery of digital value. And so that the sender, the payee, can deliver value to the payer um, ideally immediately or instantly. So they have access to funds, good funds immediately. You know, the check clearing process is, is um, a little bit outdated. Um, checks were the best we had, um, you know, years ago. They're no longer the best we have. It's, it's an effort to kind of modernize that and say, well, we want to deliver payments safely and securely immediately in good funds from payer to payee. How do we do that within our, our regional um, control, our regional sphere, and do it in a way that engages all stakeholders and makes sure they're, they're participating and they have incentives to participate in. And so those are, those are not easy things, but certainly, network design, technology, an open API, regulation, KYC, AML, those are all characteristics of how this has to be done safely and securely. But an open API on a foundation of regulated financial institutions, including regulators like a central bank, um, that allow for the safe and secure movement of funds immediately in good funds is the starting place for making that happen. Fantastic. So we have a question here from one of our attendees. It says, regarding digital banking, what are the pros and cons for the labor sector, particularly low-skilled labor? Should we expect job losses and where are the vulnerabilities? For instance, persons who physically work in check-in and out systems. So efficiency, improved efficiency in, in a payment system doesn't need to translate into job losses. Um, it, it can translate into changes of jobs if, if you happen to keep keying in checks into a computer and there's fewer checks to key in, then maybe you get a different function. Um, certainly people that are in service economies, we're seeing this in a gig economy where, um, you know, they go out and perform labor and they can actually get paid for the work that they do immediately in good funds. Those are improvements that we actually want to have here in the U.S., we're seeing a lot of activity around um, being able to pay people more quickly. So instead of on a two week payroll cycle, at the end of the day for the work that they did, um, if their day ends uh, at 12 p.m. midnight on a Friday night, how do you get them payment if the banking system closed at five? Um, so those are all the kinds of things that we're thinking about, but those are the challenges that we have to um, solve for as we're doing this next generation payment system and we're considering all the interests of all the stakeholders a labor worker finishing work at midnight it's the end of the day how do you get them paid yeah and, and perhaps i can also weigh in on this as well roland i think that um 
the question is a good one because it speaks, of course, to the job security component. Um, now, you know, I want to kind of give the assurance, right, that the thinking behind making payments easier does not result in anyone losing their job, but rather it increases the efficiency of your job so you can actually accomplish more, right? It makes you look better on your job. That's what this does, right? As Brad said, and that's a really good example because of Friday night, you know what, you know what comes after Friday night? A South Saturday morning in Barbados. You're gonna have money to access your pudding and sauce, right? Brad, that's something that we can, I don't know if you eat pork, but next time you come, you have to, to be exposed to this thing called sauce. It's a national dish on it's on Saturday mornings only. It's pork, right? <laughs> so, so, but it allows for that person that's currently in their job to look better because all the efficiencies will tend to move away so they can get more accomplished. And guess what? From the time one person accomplishes more in the, in the network, it allows for more things to happen in other parts of the network. So it means that other people will have job opportunities created for them. So rather than diminishing, I see more growth. And that's the way I see it. Absolutely, Patrick. And uh, the, the, other, the other key area is this. With, with more time, more productivity, there's more opportunities right. and the, the, the potential to retrain and repurpose and retool. So individuals don't have to say, okay, well, I no longer have a job. No, we're going we're gonna to retrain and we're going to retool and we're going to look at all of the possibilities uh, that are out there. Uh, Can I also, and, Roland, stick in this absolutely. real quick about central banks that Brad and, and uh, yeah. yourself, uh, you guys shared on, and George, of course. Central banks are, are pivotal, they're key, and the commercial banks are very important, right? And the central banks, the role that they play will change, but it doesn't mean that they will play a less prominent role. Actually, I see the central bank playing a more prominent role but a different role, a role that does not change uh, from its seven pillars that it plays now, but it's probably going to add an eighth pillar because, you know, this is so dynamic and it's so, op the opportunities are so great. It allows the central bank to, to, yes, become more efficient as well in their jobs, but the central bank becomes more empowered in their jobs to do a, a job that is more thorough because we're handing them better tools in this uh, management system. But then we also give them the opportunity to cut costs. So the central bank becomes such a more dynamic and efficient body that they, they, we actually had the central banks in mind. And Brad shared this with me so many times that, you know, the, the job that the central bank will do will be enhanced. Uh, I'm sure you would like to say some more on that. Yeah, I mean, you know, a central bank provides a, a, a key function. Um, issuance of a, of a currency. Um, monetary policy decisions on on um, you know spending within an economy and in the US there's some set of information analysis that that feeds into those decisions and so if you think about a payment system that design and actually gives the central bank better information in making their decisions in the in the economy and faster that an analysis without you know, without taking away privacy of the individual and the consumer and the business, uh, but actually provides them with aggregate information for making decisions. That's also an important component of improving uh, a payment system because that information can help make better decisions, help those making those decisions make better decisions at that input. Fantastic. So, what, what I'd like to say, uh, uh, gentlemen, first of all, thank you very much for, for coming on this, this panel and, and for sharing this information. We've got questions coming in fast and hot all the time. We're not going to be able to cover all of them on this call, but I think it, it gives us the opportunity potentially to have another call on this, but also to, to also have a look at uh, some of the cybersecurity aspects because we've had a number of calls on that, uh, questions on that, and the privacy aspect. But there's a final one here that I, that I would like to, um, to ask, and, and bear in mind, 
it would be good if we could wrap up within the next few minutes. So if, if we could keep the answer to this quite succinct. Now I know um, uh, Dr. Tanis had some uh, very integral input uh, in the ECCB uh, uh, design of their uh, central bank digital currency from the very early. So you were one of the people that, that was very early in that negotiation uh, and, and framework design. There's a question here that says, considering that the ECCB has made progress with their digital fiat currency initiative, are the other central banks in the region collaborating to piggyback on their efforts so that as a region, our CARICOM citizens could all benefit? Uh, let me be succinct, as you said, Roland. What I can say is that um, I've made um, contact with the ECCB uh, Central Bank Governor, and we've made contact with the Governor of the Central Bank of Barbados, and the future looks very bright. So can I also offer just a little bit of a suggestion here in terms of, again, it goes back to the design of, of the network and what do you want to achieve. You want to achieve ubiquity. And you can't assume, you know, when you talk about the, the, the success of M-Pesa in Kenya, you know, if you're coming in and you say you want to deliver payment system improvement for the whole region, then you'd have to have a design that allowed for interoperability. And so somebody should be able to do something. Brazil should be able to put their PIC system in place. But whatever it is globally that, you know, they should be able to connect to so that we're not, we're achieving ubiquity, we're collaborating, we're working together, and those connections are important to be formed. So the central bank of Barbados can do something, ECB, ECCB can do something, and those should be able to interoperate so that there is ubiquity within the region. Absolutely. So, so to, to summarize, from a regional perspective, we have that open payment network platform solution that every central bank can plug into, but also from a local perspective, for your, your domestic banks, you can plug into your, your local open payment network and it's ubiquitous, it's interoperable. Uh, if you have a central bank digital currency that can plug in, it's fully compliant, it's regulated, uh, and it's something that the Federal Reserve uh, has approved. So you're, you're now compliant for your uh, correspondent banking relationships to improve those relationships and do international business. So this opens up a lot of doors. Uh, gentlemen, thank you so much for joining this, this panel today. It's been amazing. I would like to thank all of the attendees for coming and also Marjorie Warden from the, the Sajikor Cave Hill Business School and all of her team that have been working extremely hard to, to put together the, these panels. It's been amazing. I'd like to thank uh, Dr. Justin Robinson as well and Dr. Anne Wallace. Thank you very much. And I'll hand over to Marjorie. All right, thank you very much, Roland. Certainly, it has been a very exciting discussion. It's been sharing a lot of information with us about digital payment systems, and we look forward to where this can go for the region because we know that it's something that's desperately needed if we're going to have those kinds of digital economies that we need for the Caribbean. I want to thank you and your panelists, certainly, for a very rich and engaging discussion. And we certainly saw the wealth of your experience and your knowledge as you were uh, going through the various questions and giving your responses. What I will say as well to our audience, I'll ask you please keep the conversation going on our Facebook page and reach out to us if you need additional information or clarification. We, as you know, this was being broadcast live on Facebook and we will definitely tag our panelists there and you can continue to ask your questions post and our panelists will look out for them and we'll encourage them to just follow our page and to provide responses to some of those questions. For more information on the Sajikor Cave Hill School of Business or our programs, please feel free to visit our website, uwichsb.org. If you require more information, reach out to us. Hopefully, if you will be, we hope that you'll be able to join us next Friday for our continuing series, Friday webinars. Our next topic will be perspectives on economic growth. We also are expecting that to be a rich and engaging discussion. I look forward to seeing you all then. Please stay safe, stay sane, and enjoy the rest of your day. 
Good Thanks afternoon. so much. God bless. Thank you. God bless. God bless. Be safe. Here at the Sajiko Kefil School of Business and Management, located at the University of the West Indies, located at the University of the West Indies, we meet the needs of the upwardly mobile professionals. Our business school functions in an evolving global space. We need to have that competitive edge. Our business school functions in an evolving global space. We need to have that competitive edge. Our academic curriculum offers a variety of courses for students. Our academic curriculum offers a variety of courses for students. Our academic curriculum offers a variety of courses for students. Our academic curriculum offers a variety of courses for students. Our academic curriculum offers a variety of courses for students. Our academic curriculum offers a variety of courses for students. Our academic curriculum offers a variety of courses for students. Our academic curriculum offers a variety of courses for students. Our academic curriculum offers a variety of courses for students. Our academic curriculum offers a variety of courses for students. Our academic curriculum offers a variety of courses for students. Our academic curriculum offers a variety of courses for students. Our academic curriculum offers a variety of courses for students. Our academic curriculum offers a variety of courses for students. Management. Our surgical care for you of business and management. Enroll, no. It's for you. Enroll, no.